I do not like assassins or men of low character. I think that's the line. Welcome, huge movie fanatic Nate stopping on by. This time I'm coming your way to review an older movie, and the whole reason I'm doing it is because I recently got this. I do own the DVD, or the Laserdisc, the DVD, and I never owned it on Blu-ray. I came across this for five bucks, and I'm like, you know what? This is a movie that kind of deserves or, 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 you know, cries out to be experienced on Blu-ray. So I'm like, five bucks? I kind of been meaning to get this anyway. Let's get the Blu-ray of Unforgiven, then I can watch it, and then probably I can review it. So I'm stopping on by to review the motion picture, which I guess in uh, 19, was it, nine, probably 92, four Academy Awards, Best Picture, Best Director, Film Editing, and Best Supporting Actor, if you care at all about Academy Awards, which I don't care about whatsoever, because so many movies that are absolutely shit win stuff, and it just, it's a bunch of politics, and I've never cared about, well, I can't say never cared, I don't care anymore if I ever cared about Academy Awards. I think it doesn't mean anything, and it's just a bunch of bullshit. But for those of you who care, it's a winner of four Academy Awards from 1992. So basically, I think, you know, Clint Eastwood obviously rose to fame with probably the, his participation in the Spaghetti Westerns of the, was it the 60s, and did it go into the 70s? I'm not a big fan of 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 Clint Eastwood or or any kind of westerns for that matter and that kind of is what put um, Clint Eastwood on the map is I think the spaghetti westerns and I think you know once he became kind of a player where um, a big player and especially once he started directing I don't think you know I don't think he's really ever in a western since maybe the late 60s early 70s I don't know what the last western was he was in before he did this from you know, from what I can remember back in the day, the, this movie before, you know, as it was coming out and stuff, it was a relatively big deal because it was like Clint Eastwood returning to the Western genre. And I remember thinking that, you know, he was obviously decades older and stuff, and I know that he plays, I think he does it a little too much where, he, you know, the whole getting old and can't get on the horse thing is maybe played out a little too much for my taste, but whatever, people, I enjoyed it, like, you know, seeing Clint Eastwood now getting on in years. I don't know how old he is in this movie, but, um, you know, not having trouble, you know, shooting a target with a pistol and having trouble get on a horse and stuff. You know, that famous scene where he's trying to shoot the can off the thing with a pistol and comes back out with the shotgun and blows away. Like, that's in the trailer and stuff. Um, I can remember being, it must have been, it, I don't know what I was seeing in the theater in 92. I know we would have seen, you know, like Alien 3 and, you know, whatever else, uh, Batman Returns, but I can't remember necessarily anything else I saw in the theater in 92, but some movie we saw in the theater, I can remember the trailer for this playing before, and I can remember a guy, he was either in front of me or, yeah, I think he was in front of me, like when, when Clint Eastwood turns around, like, I think that the, the narrator, which I think might be Optimus Prime, is like something as good as gold or so, something. And, and Clint Eastwood does that, you know, turns around in the doorway or whatever. I remember some guy in front of me or behind me is like, oh, yeah, you know, like, like, hell, I can't remember what he said, but he said something where he was like, oh, yeah, you know, bring it on. I'm ready for this movie, you know, maybe having heard pre-internet. So maybe having heard about it, maybe this is the first time he saw a trailer for it. Obviously, a guy who was excited to see Unforgiven or whatever, and I didn't know anything, probably didn't know anything about this until that trailer. I will say the trailer is really cool. Uh, it's got that one guy, you know, being hauled away in the carriage. You're a bunch of bloody savages! Um, and all that, and this and that and stuff. But, obviously, throughout the years, you know, this would have probably come out on home video in 93 or something, and... I'm pretty sure I would have seen it in 93. I didn't see it in the theater. I mean, I didn't care enough to see it in the theater, but I had an interest in it, you know. I was like, okay, I'm not a big Western guy, but I'll check it out. And I remember thinking, you know, I never hated it or anything, but I don't think it really ever blew my socks off. And obviously, I, I liked it enough back in the day to get the laser disc, and I ended up with the DVD. And probably, a, and I would imagine all three of them I bought previously viewed, the lasers, the DVD, and now the Blu-ray, but... I gotta tell you, I watched this within the last week, the, the Blu-ray, and I think I, I don't know if I would have ever saw it like this before, but it, it's almost like I saw it for the, a completely different way that I've ever seen it before, or, or you know, I, I just viewed it 
in a different way. And if I saw it this way before, it doesn't really matter. I, you know, I saw it this way now or whatever. And it's a really interesting dynamic. Basically, what happens is, you know, this guy with the, purportedly to have a, a, a smaller than average uh, unit down there, if you know what I mean, is some 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 prostitute laugh, did a little bit of giggle or laugh when she saw it, and as a result, this guy cuts her up, cuts her face up and stuff. And that's what this whole movie is about. You know, the, the, the prostitutes at, the, I guess we can call them what they call themselves, the whores at this whorehouse that she was sliced, their face was sliced up at, they all band together. Since nothing's really being done, you know, of any kind of justice, they think, you know, the guy, you know, the Gene Hackman character who's the sheriff or whatever, um, catches the guys and basically makes them give them give the whores or whatever or the guy who owns the whorehouse some horses or something and that's it and it's you know i think admittedly it's it's i think the viewer could probably agree that it's not exactly justice so the whores you know making a lot of money being whores and stuff they they save up and they they pay you know they get the word out to pay some guys whoever will take the job for however much money is a thousand dollars that'd be a lot of money back then I mean, that'd be a lot of money back then. What would that be now? A thousand dollars back then. Oh, God, that might be like a thousand dollars back then. I'm just trying to think. I mean, would that be fifty thousand dollars now? Like, I'm just trying to think of what a thousand dollars back in the wet, you know, eighteen, late eighteen hundreds would would be. I mean, now. I mean, we're talking a hundred years. You know, more than a hundred years. Would that be fifty or seventy-five thousand? I don't know what that'd be in in dollars now, but. It, a lot of money back then so this whole movie which is over two hours long is is really just about these horrors trying to get someone to kill they want this guy who sliced her up to get killed I can't remember if they want the other guy who like held her down the, the other guys you know not really I mean he's complicit I guess at holding her down but He's, he's nice because he gives her the best horse or whatever, and he's nice. And I don't know if they want them both dead. I think they do want them both dead. That's kind of sad because the guy who gave her the horse is kind of nice or whatever. Yeah, they do want them both dead because they do kill him. And I will say that, um, well, I, maybe I can talk about that later. But in case I forget, I will simply say that that scene where the first guy gets killed... You know, so many movies and westerns and, and war movies and Commando and Rambo just glorify violence and stuff. But this is like absolutely kind of the opposite where it's like the scene where they kill that first guy and he gets shot in the stomach and he's just slowly dying. And he's, oh my God, talk about it like a, a tearjerker. And that's like a realistic account of, you know, kind of violence, you know, versus the, the, the violence that might might end towards the end of the movie, which is more John Woo-ish. I mean, it's nowhere near John Woo, but I mean, you know, more like normal kind of Hollywood violence. But um, the thing that I came away with watching this this last time is that um, I don't know if I've really seen this in any other movie where the dynamic between... The, the thing that's that, that I love the most about this movie is the dynamic between, like the uh, Gene Hackman character who's the sheriff and um, I guess the Clint Eastwood character who's this guy who used to be like a really bad hombre back in the day you know killing women and children and just being drunk all the time you know what 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 he ended up doing later on in years is is, is sobering up and you know flying straight and, and marrying I guess I don't know someone who was way too young or whatever did she die at 20 years old or something Gave him two kids, and I, I yeah, I was kind of like, isn't he a little old to be? Anyway, he's uh, he's got two kids, and he's trying to be a pig farmer or something, and it's not so easy at his age and things. And uh, he's presented with this opportunity to make you know a thousand bucks. This this kid who can't see very far pr pr uh, proposes this to him, and they can cut it and ha you know split the award, you know split the reward money and. You know, he wants his help because, you know, he was this old, he's, his uncle, the, the kid who can't see very far, his uncle said he was the meanest, you know, fightest, baddest hombre in the West or whatever. So he wants his help so basically he can get $500 or whatever, which I can't imagine. That was probably a lot of money back in the late 1800s. 
but um, isn't it great what they do to money over time? It sure helps when you've got uh, savings and they just become worth less and less over time. I love it. But uh, that's a whole other video. If we lived in any kind of system that gave any kinds of rat's ass about the people that make the system what it is, they'd actually have money become worth more over time, not the fucking opposite. But again, that's a whole other video. But yeah, the, the thing I came away with this movie probably more so than ever had before previously watching it is just how interesting like Gene Hackman for all intents and purposes becomes more or less what you you know dub the bad guy and Clint Eastwood is more or less the good guy or I guess depending on your viewpoint you could almost regard Clint Eastwood as you know he's like the former bad guy who you know, is possibly still a bad guy because he was such a bad guy then. Maybe he's still the bad guy and made, maybe Gene Hackman's the good guy. Either way, what's interesting about this movie and what this movie does amazingly well is it almost, and after I watched it, I was just, I was just thinking like, wow, you know, not a lot of movies do this because most movies like Hollywood, you know, movies or whatever, have just, a, you know, if you like a Steven Seagal movie or Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, like you've got a, a bad guy. You know he's the bad guy, let's kill the bad guy. And the good guy. You know he's a good guy, kill the bad guy, good guy. And this movie is like, God, is the good guy good or is he bad? I mean, he used to be bad, is he still bad or is he good now or can he be good because he used to be so bad? And is that sheriff that's supposedly kind of the bad guy bad or is he really good because what's he doing that's so bad he's just trying to freaking keep guns out of the town so that the town is safe and you know so to in order to keep his town safe he's got to be in gene hackman character admittedly is and this is a really cool thing about his character is that uh they, they he really has an efficient way of like you know taking care of any like you know dissidents in the town there's a sign as you come into town that says you know all firearms must be surrendered to the you know sheriff's office or, or whatever to keep the town safe and if someone slips through there as we find out you know the whole the 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 um i can't remember the name of the the, the one guy i think it's english bob that character the, his character kind of only exists i think to just show um to give the audience uh, an idea of the, what the Gene Hackman character is capable of. So then when he comes up against Clint Eastwood at the end, it's kind of, you you know, we've, we've, we've seen Gene Hackman, what he's capable of, and then we've heard what uh, the, the, the Clint Eastwood character was capable of. So as they come together, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I will say, that I think the most, some of the most interesting part of the movie is like the Gene Hackman, uh, English Bob stuff. And the English Bob guy is, uh, this Brit who's like a cowboy guy in, in America and he's got some bio, you know biographer following him around and you know writing down his exploits which turned out to be all a sack of shit lies and stuff because Gene Hackman was there and he can back it up and stuff and or um, you know I don't know if the movie necessarily plays that uh, that Gene Hackman could be lying I, I think I think yeah, I mean, I mean, one could assume, you know, that could, I guess, be assumed that who says what Gene Hackman is the truth, but he, had, you know, because English Bob, he, he comes into town and, you know, isn't going to be dissuaded by the, you know, the gun, the sign to whatever. English Bob isn't going to let a sign deter him from just being armed. That's a part of his whole experience. And for the court, you know, the biographer is, you know, following him around. He probably doesn't want to look bad. And, Front of the biographer as well and plus he's used to being you know able to defend himself but in a show of force you know it's really cool that gene hackman what's really cool is you kind of really you know th this scene you're really kind of rooting for the gene hackman character because he's got all his deputies surrounding him with rifles and stuff so he, you know english bob's not going to do anything and there's this confrontation where they've seen each other before and hey good to see you and you know i can't remember all the specifics and stuff but you know, he actually, you know, Gene Hackman ends up disarming English Bob and kind of beat the shit out of him and throw him in jail. And the biographer kind of stays behind and ends up wanting to be the Gene Hackman character biographer. And as a side point, uh, you know, the frickin', um, I don't know why this is a side point, but it is. What the hell? I appreciate little details like this. Uh, the Gene Hackman character's building his own house and he can't build worth a damn and his roof leaks and all this kind of stuff. I guess it's just maybe a little comic relief and uh, 
just showing that he's not this Superman that he kind of otherwise, you know, looks like he is. You know, he's human after all. He can't build a house worth a damn. But yeah, some of the most interesting stuff that happens in this movie is like between Gene Hackman and the English Bob character and, and Gene Hackman stuff. And like I say, you really can't, you know, Gene Hackman, I think, is more or less supposed to be kind of the bad guy, more or less. And you can't really fault him for doing what he does in this movie. And that's what's really interesting. And it gets you to thinking, like I say, maybe, it, so is Gene Hackman, is he the bad guy or is he the good guy? You know, it's kind of for the viewer to decide. And that's what's really kind of cool about this movie. I'm not generally a big fan of Clint Eastwood movies I think more or less and I haven't seen a whole hell of a lot of them but I think more or less they're just kind of just your average kind of movie fare and especially in later years like they're they're just they don't go very far beyond just the basic things that can be tackled in a mainstream movie you know how the mainstream just stays safe because it's just more uh, more more uh whatever it's just it's if you if you stay safe and just straight down the line you're more marketable or it, it's safer you might make more money you might appeal to the the general you know casual movie going public kind of a thing and you know from my experience in the later you know Clint Eastwood movies I mean it just gets more and more like that that one movie which the trailer looks so boring whatever he did Richard Jewell or whatever the hell it was like you know, so many movies he's done in, 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 in the 21st century, like, I haven't seen them, but you've seen the trailers and stuff, and you're just like, oh my god, like, how boring and trite and just, you know, even, even like, you know, The Mule or whatever wasn't much of anything, and, you know, like, Gran Torino, I guess, maybe was a little on a higher tier, maybe more closer to, to, um, Unforgiven, in my opinion, but this might be the my favorite movie he's like in and and you know and or directed. Like I think that this is you know this is long ago enough where maybe he still had some competence or whatever, or somehow competence came out or or whatever. But in general, I I just I find him I find his movies to be not particularly amazing per se, and I never found him to be particularly amazing per se. I think, you know, I mean, I like him probably mostly as like Dirty Harry, you know, kind of a thing and never really cared much for much of, of what he did or whatever. So that's just some of my thoughts on uh, Clint Eastwood. But yeah, this this movie is is pretty interesting and he ends up, you know, getting, um, he ends up getting help from his, his buddy Morgan Freeman as well and and what ensues with that situation and like i say these guys are you know a lot older than they were when they were shooting and rooting and tooting and shooting back when they were younger and it's it's, it's interesting seeing like their reactions to doing this stuff now like you know morgan freeman's all disgusted about you know being an assassin now and he can't even finish it and you know he gives uh clint eastwood the rifle and and even even Clint Eastwood's like, give them give him some water, you know. He's like, give me some water. The 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 kid who got shot, you know, he's dying. He, give me some water, please. And that scene is just really well done. I will say that. And uh, yeah, it's a really what's great about this movie is I guess and what it was kind of praised for a lot back in the day is you know it it it, it turns the this genre which he's so famous for on its head and does something that's a, lo a lot different than what I think a lot, I mean, I don't, I, I think I've seen one of like his famous spaghetti westerns, but I can only assume that this movie does, you know, I've seen a decent amount of westerns, and I think this movie really does, you know, I, I would say, and this is coming from someone who hasn't seen a whole hell of a lot of westerns, but I would say that this might be one of the best freaking westerns that I've seen, or probably is the best western that I've seen, it might be one of the best westerns in general, because it's like, it just so kind of turns everything on its head or, or whatever and, and just is kind of different, or at least in my experience and stuff. So, yeah, you know, I think it's a, a relatively well done movie and the, like the, the two hours plus running time goes by really, really fast. Like it, 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 it moves along at a great pace. And honestly, you know, the, we don't see Gene Hackman anymore in movies and stuff. Like seeing him back in the day and being in a, in a freaking Gene Hackman being in a movie, like, that's, that's a face from my youth and stuff. He was much more in movies in the 70s, obviously, and 80s and things. And so seeing him again, like, in an older movie from the early 90s is cool. 
and uh, yeah, I, a competent, a competent, uh, a competent outing, or you know, whatever you want to call this movie, or whatever. That's for sure. And from what I understand, like they built this whole. It just seems like they say, oh, they spend so much money to make movies. They built this whole town that you see in this movie. They built for the movie, and it's just like, wow, that's a lot of money. But um, that's a lot of money spent on this movie, but I'm sure it made a lot of money back, so I guess I guess it's worth it. But I gotta admit, the fact that I don't watch this movie very often, every time I see it, you know, I watch it every who knows how long, every seven years or so, and every time I watch it, I forget about what happens with, uh, I, I won't even spoil it, what, what happens regarding Morgan Freeman, I'll simply say, and like, Every time that hap every time I see that that's what happens, I'm like, oh God, I forgot about that. That really goes there, and I guess that's what sets up the, you know, obviously all the motivation for what happens to the um, the Clint Eastwood character at the end, and then you know having set up uh, Gene Hackman with Silent, not Silent Bob, English Bob <laughs> situation. The um, you know, then it's like, okay, we've got this guy, what he can do, set up, and we've heard about what Clint Eastwood could do, and now Clint Eastwood is mad. So let's put these two together and see what happens kind of a thing. And I think at the end of the day, perhaps, you know, the the end could have been, didn't maybe quite live up to what it could have been or what maybe one would have hoped it would have been. But, at the, you know, the Clint Eastwood character was older and stuff. And one thing that I do think is interesting is when they came into town, they couldn't see the sign, the gun, you know, surrender the gun sign in the rain. And Clint Eastwood was all sick with the flu or whatever, and just how he was treated when he was all sick and stuff. That was an interesting scene because I was replaying it in my head after I watched it. I'm like, okay, well, you know, in in in, in um, Gene Hackman says, I guess he didn't see the sign in the rain at night and in the in the dark and everything. But then the fact that he was like willing to let it go, and then the fact that he lied about having a gun on him that's kind of belligerent. I was, I was, you know, going on a walk and I was thinking about it to myself. I'm like, yeah, I mean, that's, in the, that's kind of a situation where the Gene Hackman character is in the right because Clint Eastwood character lied, you know, and that's, that's belligerent behavior. So not that he deserved to get the shit kicked out of him when he's got the flu at the, at that time. But I mean, you can, you can see where Gene Hackman's coming from. He just won't take anything in order to keep the the town safe so it's like a really interesting like i say in closing that's my favorite thing about this whole movie is just the fact that the bad guy in this movie is one of the less bad bad guys that i've ever experienced in a movie because you can pretty much agree with the majority if not all of his his stance on where he's coming from and i gotta say at the very end when when possibly his life is about to expire you actually feel for him like laying there and he says whatever he says I don't deserve this or or whatever and it's like I kind of agree like you know the guy's just trying to build a house on a lake and so it's it's one of my it's one of the most interesting like good guy bad guy whatever things that I've seen in movies so my star rating would be um I can go oh god I don't know if I can go four stars. We'll go. We'll go almost four stars. We'll go three and three quarter stars out of four stars for Unforgiven. There's just, I don't know what it is about the movie where I can't go a full four. But I'm not a. Well, it doesn't help that I'm not a Western fan very much at all. But this is probably my favorite Western. I mean, The Wild Bunch is really good as well. I saw that in the '90s when it was like remastered or whatever. So The Wild Bunch is some classic Western. I gotta show Beth The Wild Bunch. I do have that on Blu-ray. So, Wild Bunch and Unforgiven are probably a couple of my favorite westerns, and that's coming from a guy who doesn't really even necessarily like westerns per se, but yeah, if you haven't seen this movie and you want to see this movie, I'd say see this movie. <laughs> Makes sense, don't it? But I guess that'll pretty much do it for my review of Unforgiven. Like I say, I remember it being a big deal back in the day, and of course after it won four Academy Awards it became even a bigger deal because, you know, what they say matters. Why? It just, just does because they're on TV and they got a room full of celebrities and they're dressed good and they got good lighting and yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I guess that'll about do it for my review. Hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks so much for watching and as always, we'll catch you on the next video.